Welcome to Canada's podcast. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Canada's podcast. My name is Rivers Corbett. I am so fortunate to be on at the Atlantic coast because that's where entrepreneurship is alive and well and uh, be the host for uh, for this region. And today, just thrilled to have a great friend, a great colleague, a um, just one of those guys that, well, he knows that I love him to death and, and he just oozes entrepreneurship. Uh, has uh, been a part of many educational institutions. And I wanted to bring Dr. Danny Brown into the conversation today because he just plays in a different level of entrepreneurship, yet a very important play mm-hmm. in that level. So uh, Dr. Danny Brown, Dr. B, Danny, actually, what do the kids call you, Dr. B? Dr. B, yeah. Dr. B, right Dr. on. B. Welcome to the uh, Canada's yeah. podcast, Dr. B. Uh, we're just thrilled to have you on here today. Thanks. It's great to be here. Always when I'm with you, it's a good time. We do. We have a lot of fun, don't we? we you know, the last time we chatted, we were talking with an, an, a very esteemed group of international students of yours and who always do have great questions. Always, always, always. They're so into it. And uh, and I got to say this too, awfully polite. They're a very yeah. polite group of individuals, yeah. too. Yeah. So yeah. just a little bit of, uh, of Danny's background. He's been an educator for over 40 years. Uh, the last couple of years, he's been flirting with the R word, specializing in entrepreneurship. He was the executive director of the International Business and, and Entrepreneurship Center at UNB, uh, served as a professor and administrator in higher education at two amazing universities in Atlantic Canada. And um, just, you know, he's uh, he's got a lovely family, unfortunately, and he knows I'm going to jab him about this. He's a Toronto Maple Leafs <laughs> fan, but he's a true Toronto Maple Leafs <laughs> fan. <laughs> And so on that note, by the way, before I before I uh, get into the conversation, what was going through your head, my friend, when the Montreal Canadiens were heading to the final of the Stanley Cup after uh, after, of course, ceremoniously, not unceremoniously. I think it was all part of the plan to uh, beat the, beat the Leafs in seven. So what went through your head when you saw that happening? Well, you know, as a grandfather, I failed miserably at getting any of my grandkids to be Maple Leafs fans. And (laughs) the the two oldest boys are Habs fans. Oh, yeah. And so when the Leafs were uh, out uh, and the Habs were left, uh, my wife jumped on the the Habs bandwagon really fast. I, I, I crawled on. (laughs) <laughs> it just very, very reluctantly, but because I love my grandson so much, I, I, I had to support them to some degree. Yeah, yeah. it hurt. Well, no, it hurt. Of course, of course, it hurt. Of course, it hurt. <laughs> I totally get it. It's like I've got a, I've got, of course, a love in for Tom Brady, who's now with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, but, uh, and I wish him well, but I'm a, I'm a Patriots fan for sure. So, uh, yeah, fun stuff all around. Fun stuff all around. Well, look, uh, Dr. B, let's kind of dive into this whole environment of entrepreneurship. And what I want to touch in is something for personally, first of all, why did you pick the route of becoming an educator in that environment? What was that, 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 that pulling force that you said, I need to go get a PhD in entrepreneurship? Well, uh, really, if you want to go back far enough, um, I, I was raised in a situation where, you know, uh, we didn't have a whole lot. Uh, my mom was a single mom. And uh, I, I learned very early on that if I was going to make things, have things happen in my life, I was going to have to make them happen myself. And right. I, think, I think that's an entrepreneurial spirit, uh, mm. you know, that has been with me from early days. And uh, I've often told my students, you know, uh, don't wait for somebody else to solve your problem, uh, solve your problem yourself. And in in doing that, you'll solve other people's problems as well. Yes, I love it. I love it. Yeah. And dude, you come from a family like I'm 40, 45 kids or something, don't you? I think it's round up to there. So 17, 17. 17. Yeah, I saw yeah. a picture of you the other day on there. And so kudos to your mom to uh, to keep the family together. Kudos to you to bring in that spirit of entrepreneurship. And so so what um, what what is what are the areas that you're now finding 
our regular conversations around the topic of entrepreneurship that are happening in the public. And then I want to get into what you think they should be talking about. Yeah, well, in education, uh, I've noticed in the last probably seven to 10 years, a, a big push on experiential learning. And I know it's a bit yeah. of a buzzword, but, um, you know, back in the day, again, because of an at this for a long time, our schools used to have a lot more experiential learning when they had, you know, industrial arts, when they had business education, when right. they had home economics and stuff like that. And that's been moved out of the public schools for the large part. But uh, we know pedagogically, too, that people learn by doing. So uh, unfortunately, for those of us who lecture a lot, uh, research shows that students don't pay attention much to lectures. Uh, yes. But if you can get them to do something, uh, they'll learn it much faster. And so uh, we've got to continue to do more, to the second part of your question, to bring more experiences uh, into the learning process for the students. And I think what we're doing here at Crandall is speaking to that a bit because um, we're trying to, to make the courses so much more interactive. Uh, yes. The Masters of Management program specifically that we offer has, has um, an internship uh, component to it. And uh, so they take a whole semester where they're out uh, in, the, in the business learning and uh, working. And it's been a very successful thing. And it's one of the very marketable things that's drawing students to our program. I love it. You know, just for a reference point, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Dr. B also was a professor at the College of Cape Breton. I think that's at the, is that the way you describe it? College Cape, of Cape Breton, Breton University. <laughs> Cape Breton. It started <laughs> off as a college, though, if I remember correctly. Francis <laughs> Xavier Junior College originally. Ah, I love that. <laughs> yeah, I it's, love it's that. like Crandall. It's had many different names over the years. But yeah, it's a CBU, Cape Breton University. Yeah. And oh my, my nine years there, I want to say for everybody, were amazing. I learned so much there and really had a life changing experience with the international students there. Yeah, so that, that's that's kind of where I want to go next. And thank you for that. I just want to have the reference point is that, uh, you know, you are an accomplished, you've been a journeyed man with regards to your education, but also in helping to educate those people that are in uh, doing entrepreneurship. I want to talk about international business, but then I want to talk about business in Atlantic Canada from an entrepreneurial perspective. So what are you experiencing? What are you seeing out there internationally that, for entrepreneurs, they really, you know, what are the, the top three things, four things? What are some elements you're coaching somebody that wants to do international business? We're used to doing, dealing with the economic agencies, the Opportunity New Brunswick's of the, the world, the Nova Scotia Inks of the world telling us what we need to do. But from an educate, from a, you know, from an academic perspective, what are those, what are those nuggets of wisdom that you can bring to the Atlantic Canadian entrepreneurs that we're now talking to? Well, Atlantic Canada is no different than the rest of the world right now. We're, we're seeing the diversity, we're seeing the multiculturalism hit us in every uh, employment sector there is. And uh, uh, so we want our students to realize that uh, what they're seeing in the classroom is just a microcosm of what's out there uh. in the workplace as well. And uh, we're, we're seeing uh, our international students are coming very much with the entrepreneurial spirit in mind. They, they want to make it happen. They want to make their own way. They're not looking for a handout. And so uh. many of our students have already started several businesses, actually, here in Moncton, uh, all because of, you know, they saw a need and they fill it, you know, the old marketing, you know, uh, mantra, uh, find the gap and fill it. And that's what right. they've been doing. And, and so for them, I, I think for international uh, entrepreneurs, uh, one of the things that seems to be, uh, I wouldn't say missing, but not necessarily understood the way that you know, we would hear in the West is the idea of customer service. So right. that's, a, that's a little bit yeah. of, a, of a hill to climb, but as soon as they get it, man, they got it. And uh, right. they, they, they jump right into it very quickly. Can you give us an example of, that's an interesting segue here. What do you mean they don't understand customer service? Well, customer service, uh, we, we know how important it is to us here in North America, but customer service is not... Uh, you know, something that is understood in the same way around the world. 
uh, there's, there's some places where, you know, take it or leave it. And that's the attitude and that's the culture. But right. the culture in uh, North America is customer is number one. And we need to serve our customers and be nice to our customers, yes. you know, because our customers are our existence. And if we don't have customers, we don't have a business. So let me ask you this question. If I'm if I'm uh, doing business in one of these areas, what's one of these geographical areas, which regions that that take it or leave it? Can you give me a, an example of that? Well, I don't want to, you know, act disparagingly or speak disparagingly yeah, about enough, any country, enough. you know. So, uh, but there are places, you know, where it's just it's another it's another way of life. Does it become okay? So, so here's here's where I was getting at. Does it become a competitive advantage then, as an international entrepreneur, to go? I'm going to go in there and give them love and attention that they hadn't had before, or or is that region? Just going to be, I mean, because we talk a lot with entrepreneurs about you've got to assimilate yourself into the environment you're going into. You've right. got to learn their culture and so on. Yeah. So is that an example, though, of no, actually, that's a competitive advantage? It is. And uh, so it's interesting. I, I used to say to the students, because when I was at Cape Breton University, uh, oftentimes in the summer, the international students would go back home. Sometimes right. after one or two years of being away. And when they come back, I'd say, you know, man, did you notice that things changed quite a bit when you went home? Oh, my goodness. Yeah, they changed a lot. You know, whatever. I said, no, they didn't. They didn't change mm. at all. You changed. Wow. And, and the beauty of that is while we want many of these students to stay in Canada and make Canada their new life, many of them go back home. Right. They go back home, different people. They go back home with these new ideas. They go back home with these new experiences. And they do have a competitive advantage. Now, they're not always necessarily embraced totally when they go back home or whatever, but it gives them a different uh, a way to look at things and to present their business in a way that nobody else is presenting it. And so yeah. you've got your differentiation that gives you a competitive advantage that you didn't even expect. The uh, the I, I know a guy that runs by a very simple philosophy. You win the game of business when you zag when everybody else zigs, and so that's what you're teaching them to do. So let me let me ask you this question because I, I'm intrigued with with international students coming to Atlantic Canada. I'm always so appreciative of that. You know, when I speak to them, I always I always ooze with appreciation. What is your opinion on our Atlantic Canadian entrepreneurs who are in that education space doing the complete opposite, going to entrepreneur schools in India or to Nigeria or to, I don't know, Syria. I don't know Syria is a good example, but you know my point. Is that something you'd recommend? Because your students are obviously getting value coming to New Brunswick with Crandall. Would you suggest the opposite might be a value too? Um, I can't, so I'll choose my words carefully. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, it can't get much better than what it is here, you know, yeah, in many right, ways. Yeah. But, but I would always recommend, and I, and I tell, you know, all of my Canadian students, whatever, you know, stripe that might be, if you, as a student, if you don't go and spend at least one semester abroad, you may right. regret it for the rest of your life. Because yeah. it, it changes you in a way that you never could imagine. And um, I, I wish that when I was doing my undergrad work that I would have had that kind of an experience because I know it would have changed me sooner, you know, yes. and, and given me a greater worldview than, than when I did get my worldview. And, yeah. and there's just so much to learn from one another. Uh, and, and, and I mean, even though they may do entrepreneurship differently than we do, there's still some things you could pick up. But, right. but man, I, I think that we're pretty good at what we do for the most part. Man, if you were vote, you were running in that election last night, I would have voted for you just for that answer right there. That was a good answer, man. You skated that one so so well, and I agree with you. You know, I'm I've been hanging out in this entrepreneurship yeah. space in Canada for a long time, and yeah. I agree. We 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 get it really dialed in down, really really good, and we're so lucky to have what we have. Yeah. I want to touch a bit into your entrepreneurial journey, and uh, and it has to do with your customers, your students. Because you run a department that 
is about bringing international customers to Crandall University. And why I want to talk about that is because you something that you alluded to a little earlier in the conversation. You may not have been an entrepreneur, but you think entrepreneurial. Right. And that, I think, is very advantageous for any entrepreneur to have around him or her, a team of entrepreneurial thinking people. Actually, uh, Richard Branson, you would have well versed on him. He, uh, he says when his companies get to 100 people, he breaks them back down into 50 because he doesn't want them to lose that entrepreneurial yeah. spirit. So yeah. talk to me about how you run your business as the dean of the International uh, international Business uh, uh, Department. You make a good point because I've always been of the opinion that all the entrepreneurs are not out on Main Street. Uh, entrepreneurship is a spirit. Entrepreneurship is an attitude. And that needs to be, um, you know, uh, developed and, and ingrained in, in all of us. Because I think the more entrepreneurial that we can be, uh, the better our whole society is. Um, uh, entrepreneurship, as far as my students go, uh, again, means, you know, finding as many different ways that we can serve them. Uh, providing them with an education really is only a vehicle, in my mind, to really serving our students. Uh, right. International students particularly come to us, I like to say this, leaving family, food, and faith. And, uh. and, and they're hitting a huge, um, you know, culture shock for most of them when they come here. Even the way education is done in North America is not the way that it's done around the world. So the learning style is different. Some of them uh. come from very, you know, you sit and you listen and you don't speak kind of environments to the kind of environment here where we want them to talk, you know, and, and interact and mm. ask questions and whatnot. And that seems very foreign to them. Um, yeah. Helping them to understand that there's something that they themselves can do to change their situation and encouraging them by saying, look, you guys are already winners because you've taken the risk, the calculated yes. risk to leave that family faith and food behind, to come yes. to Canada, to start a new life, to put what you already got together in a box and expand on it. Yes, yeah, 100%. So how do you go find them? Yeah, well, so, I mean, again, I had the, the blessing, privilege, whatever, good fortune of, of being involved at Cape Breton University where they just saw a massive influx of international students. And the president here at Crandall says, you know, if Danny hadn't gone away, he wouldn't have been able to come back. Uh, yes. So we knew that the low hanging fruit was in India. So we started obviously, you know, looking there and, and, and as students were coming to us, we started listening to what it is that they wanted in their programs. So we had originally created a one year program, uh, but for those who were coming with immigration as a, as a final uh, uh, goal, they could apply only for a one year post-graduation work permit. So if we had a two-year program, they could apply for a three-year post-graduation work permit. So we immediately, the very uh, next year, came up with a two-year program. Nice. And the second thing that they wanted was this internship opportunity. They wanted a way to get into the Canadian business, you know, and, and learn that way. They knew they wouldn't get that just from the classroom and the university setting. So that was the second thing we did. We created the two-year program and we put an internship option into that. And, and the next thing that we're doing uh, is uh, putting one of our programs online, hoping to launch uh, in January of uh, 2022. Uh, and that will serve mainly a, a domestic market. But we're seeing, you know, because of COVID partly, you know, everybody's becoming more and more comfortable with the online environment. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. As much as it has some drawbacks, it's got all kinds of advantages as well, too. Yeah, totally it does. Well, and that's the uh, journey of the entrepreneur, right? You uh, you adjust, you quote unquote pivot. I love that yeah. word. Everybody yeah. is kind of hung up on that word. Oh, I don't want to say that word. I don't want to hear it anymore. Yeah. I said, if it's good enough for the MBA to keep <laughs> calling it what it is, why yeah. am I going to stop talking it as a, as, as a pivot? You also form partnerships in India, do you not, with 
organizations, because this is part of the sales process. You're not over there. You're using people who are local, know the culture, know the language, know the faith, know the family, know the food to have those conversations for you. Can you talk a bit about that? Because I think it's a great business strategy of lead generation. Yeah, so so this is all about networking, and this is one of the other things that has been a lifelong mantra of mine. You know that your network is your net worth, yeah. uh, and and I thank Annette for sure, and a fabulous entrepreneur uh, from Cape Breton originally, actually, but have been very very successful uh, entrepreneur. And anyway, and this is something that she says in her book, Bet on Me, uh, is you know that your network is your net worth. So. Um, it's one thing for us to go to India with, uh, you know, qualified recruiters and stuff like this, but it's another thing to have somebody on the ground, somebody mm. who is from India, somebody who knows the different areas, like Northern India is very different than Southern India, and, and mm. uh, the level of education in some areas is better than others. Uh, the ability of the students to pay is better in some areas than others. And so mm. having somebody on the ground there who has that, you know, hands-on knowledge uh, just increases our ability to attract the student that we want. And, and we found this initially, you know, the, the very first few students that we got were, eh, you know, well, maybe not exactly what we wanted or whatever. But we are finding and have found now in the last couple of years the amazing quality of students that we're getting. And it's because we're being more and more targeted about where we, you know, recruit and with whom and stuff like this. So it, it is very important to have, you know, feet on the ground for sure. Now they're, and what they do in turn is sort of train us as well to know right. what to look for in the other markets where we go, because, because we're all over the world trying to find different markets. I love that. I, you know, um, what I'm, what I'm interested in, I'm, Here's a question, and I'm gonna. I'm what I'm hesitating for because I want to preface it for. I, as you know, I ran a gourmet burger operation twelve years, or not twelve years. It was more like seven or eight. Anyway, my point is, is that I also looked for partners who understood what the environment was like and so on. But I didn't dig a little bit deeper, and I should have. And that partnership ultimately caused the demise of Relish Gourmet Burgers. I don't mind saying that. It wasn't the food. It was that partnership we set up. How do you qualify these people who you want to work with? Because they're, you know, every girl's pretty, every guy's <laughs> handsome, but then you gotta, you gotta go hang out with them for a bit. So is there a qualification process that you, uh, that you go through? Oh, oh my goodness. Um, if you only knew the field of um, uh, international agents, oh yes. my goodness. I mean, there are some really shysters out there right. uh, who right. deal with very unethical practices and stuff like this. And uh, we've been very fortunate. We haven't got caught too many times, uh, it, with, you know, but uh, we... We go with the with the well-known agents, those right. that have been around the world and have been doing it for a while and have good reputations and stuff like that. Right. And again, we had that advantage that we weren't the first ones doing it, right? right. So, right. so we could we could talk to other schools and colleagues who have who have done this in the past and where did they have success and with whom and stuff like that. So yeah, do your homework. It's again, it's another thing I tell my students all the time. If you start a business without doing your research. You deserve yeah. to fail. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. Yeah. That's, so what are you saying to me, ladies and gentlemen, when I have <laughs> failed, I deserve to fail. And I have a few times because, I mean, that, and that's, that's a, you know, it's all around a good point because we entrepreneurs, are, we get driven by emotion, the, yeah. the thrill of the chase. And we forget to figure out we got a mountain to climb here and we got to be ready for it. Um, what are the things, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, that, that, uh, Dr. Brown is very, uh, well, he's, he's very well connected, as he said, but what you may not know is that there is an international organization that started in Moncton, New Brunswick, of which Dr. Brown was one of the original mentors of. I, don't think, I think that you were a professor of these gentlemen, or at least one of them, were you not? All uh, of them. Were, all of them. Well, Probably I good. mean, Walter wasn't involved at the beginning, but Jeremy and uh, and Ken, for sure, yeah. Yeah, well, I can't imagine having Walter Melanson in as a student. He'd, <laughs> he'd be quite the challenge. But uh, propertyguys.com, if you don't know much about the story, 
learn about it. It's an incredible story. And uh, Dan, Danny Brown was a part of that, uh, that original journey with those folks and continues to be great mentors for them. They're, they're, it's just a, a great, great story. So, so not only is in academics, but is helping entrepreneurs uh, locally. One more question, and then we're going to close off this, this conversation. You know, when I am, when I was working with my relish gourmet burgers, um, we did get some foreigners, newcomers come and ask for work. And how do you, you know, and they, 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 they face these challenges because of language, because of things that they shouldn't have to face and so on. What's your message to the entrepreneurs in Atlantic Canada about the quality and in the intention and the and the and the and the credibility of these amazing people I've had the luxury to meet through uh, you. What do you say to them when they're considering bringing in uh, those type those individuals into their business to work with them in these internships and so on? Well, and and again, I don't ever like to speak you know disparagingly about any, anyone you know, but but I, too many um, business owners in Canada have said to me. I would hire students from X country any day because they're so loyal. They'll do anything you ask them to do. They're very polite. They're, they have a great work ethic and, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and then they follow that up by saying, I can't find that around here, you know? Yeah. And so um, we, we and, and the students that come here, um, one hundred percent of the students who are looking for a job have found one, and and to start with, they're willing to do anything because they mm-hmm. know how important mm-hmm. it is to get in there and to, yeah. to make a start somehow, and then they use the network that they create there to move out into the other places where they want to go. So yeah. I, I say to employers, um, open up your heart and open up your business, uh, yeah. and you will not be disappointed. Oh, sure. There's going to be one here and there, you know, or whatever, but that's the way it's going to be. But on the whole, I've not had any major issues uh, that any employers have. And as a matter of fact, employers say to me, uh, if you got any more. Right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> that's very cool. Very, very cool. Well, Dr. Brown, you continue to be all around amazing. We do this big love in when we're about to part him and I. And if we could do some sort of a, a physical uh, kind of hug, we would. Great friend, great colleague, very smart, just always there for me. And I am, I'll continue to be always there for you. Here's a question I've got for you because, um, oh, actually, first of all, before I ask this question, how can people get a hold of you? You on LinkedIn? You on uh, what are your social media platforms? Well, okay, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Facebook, uh, WeChat, um, WhatsApp. I'm on all of those. Yeah, I'm so, not on TikTok. <laughs> not on TikTok. But here's so here's the next part of that conversation. They're going to ask is that who gave you the spelling of the name Danny? Because it's not D A N N Y. It's D A N N I E, and yep. which is a zag, which so fits with your personality. Was that was that your yeah. model Oh yes, it was. And my name is not Daniel; it is just Danny. But you know what she did to top it all off? You know what? My middle name, the initial, is L. So when I put Danny and then L for my initial, people think my name is Daniel with two N's. So. God bless my departed mother. You know, she cursed me with that spelling, but yet it has, you know, right. It has contributed to my uniqueness, whatever that might be. Yeah, well, I know what it is, and it's why I keep coming. I hang out with rock stars, and you're one of them. Danny Brown, Dr. Danny Brown, who's the dean of the international uh, department, student's department, whatever you want to call it, at a Crandall University in Moncton. This has been a wonderful conversation. Uh, you have served the entrepreneurs well in that. My name's Rivers Corbett. Ladies and gentlemen, I am your Atlantic Canada host. If you've got an interest in being on our show, just go to canadaspodcast.com. And then there's an application process that you can go through. And uh, we would sure love to have the opportunity to chat. Dr. Brown, thank you, brother. My pleasure. Thanks so much.